Thank you for being here this morning. We're here. We have a very sweet and uh, difficult task in front of us. We're going to celebrate Charlie Bessel's life and his legacy. Gather here today to talk about a husband of many, many years, a father and a grandfather. Uh, for many of you, he was a brother, a friend, a mentor, or maybe the guy that you went bowling with. We're here to honor his life and speak fondly of who he was and talk about the comfort that we can have as people who believe in the hope of Christ, uh, that Charlie has joined his Savior, many other family members and friends in heaven, but we're here to commit him to God's keeping, both his memory on earth as well as his eternal destiny. So you hear a lot of talk about yesterday and also a lot of talk about right now that Charlie's okay. Charlie's okay. But I want, want to invite you to do some difficult things today. None of us like to say goodbye. In a sense, there's a goodbye that we need to say. Uh, none of us like to grieve. We all do that differently. I invite you to do that as the Lord leads, but also laugh. You've been doing that already. Watch the slideshow and think, wow, what an amazing life. Well lived. Comfort one another. This group of people will never be together again like we are today. So enjoy that. Enjoy your time together, reuniting with family and friends. But on behalf of Gene, especially, and Becky and Debbie, all their family grieving their loss, thanks for being here for them as well. Not just today, but in the days and the weeks and the months ahead. What we need is the presence of the Lord in our lives and the promise of God is that He's always with us. He would never leave us, never forsake us, all the way to the very end. But sometimes when we have tough days, it feels like God has taken a step backwards. He has not. So a lot of the scriptures that we will lift up today are here to remind us that Christ is still with us, uh, just like He is every day of our lives. So I'm going to read the 23rd Psalm. It's a Something you can take home with you. You probably memorized it if you were in Sunday school as a kid. But I want you to hear that God is saying that he is with us right now. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As Christians, we gather, we, you know, we're, we're almost at Easter, and so we're remembering all that God has done for us. We remember that Christ died, and when he died, he paid a price for everybody who would trust him, a price for their sin, a debt that he did not owe. And when God raised him from the dead three days later, he made a promise that all who would trust in Christ, just like he had been raised from the dead, would not uh, in the end be destroyed by death, but overcome death. Charlie is an overcomer today. In baptism, uh, the symbolism is we put on Christ, almost like a garment. May Charlie now be clothed with Christ in glory. The Bible says, here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed, but we know that when he reappears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. My modern translation is something like this. If you think you like Charlie in this life, you ought to see him now. <laughs> then the Bible says, those who have this hope purify themselves because Christ is pure. Jesus said to grieving sisters, they had just lost their brother Lazarus. I am the resurrection and I am the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet they shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And then Jesus said words no one else has ever said. He said, because I live, you also shall live. So I invite you to pray with me now as we gather in this holy place. Lord, you know that we're not really sure how to pray on our best days, and then on tough days, even less. So hear us as we groan, as we try to form words, as we try to express what's in our hearts, that we have deep sadness. Lord, we're not sure what to ask for on days like today. Things like grace and mercy, they sound about right. God, would you give us strength? Would you let us draw near to you? 
Would you let us believe with great faith that you are with us and that you are for us? God, help us as we shrink before the mystery of death that we may also be reminded of eternal life in Christ. Speak to us once more your, your solemn messages of life and death and help us to live as people who are prepared to die. And when our days here are accomplished, as Charlie's were this past week, enable us to die as those who go forth to live so that it would come true what is written that living or dying our life in you, nothing would separate us from your great love for us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Families asked a dear friend, Ralph Sparks, to play some great music for us today, so we're going to listen to the first piece that they've chosen. Some of the things that uh, the family has chosen to write publicly about Charlie, you'll be able to take these on in the bulletin you've got. Charles, Charlie E. Vestal, 91 years old, passed away on March 11th, this past Saturday, at his home, surrounded by his family. He was born March 1st, 1932, in Waxahachie, to James Asbury and Ollie Day Vestal. Charlie moved to the Waco area at an early age attended University High School and served his country in the U.S. Army during the Korean War. He then went to work for Texas Meter and Device in Waco and soon after met the love of his life, Gene Waddell. Charlie was employed for 48 years as manager of Lake Air Bowling Lanes, where he promoted and taught that sport. 
developed many lasting friendships, and was inducted for his ability and commitment into both the local and state USBC Hall of Fame. He was a member of this church, Renewed Church, which was formerly Lakewood Christian Church for many, many years. In fact, they got married uh, like two sanctuaries ago. That's how we refer to it. <laughs> he will be remembered for his great sense of humor, compassion for others, love for spending quality time with his family and many friends. Charlie was a loving husband, father, papa, friend, and he will be missed dearly. Preceded in death by his mother, Ollie, his father, James, his sister, Helen, his brothers, George and James. He is survived by his wife of 59 years, Jean of Waco, his daughter, Debbie, and her husband, Grant of Arlington, his daughter, Becky, and her husband, Brian of Maybank. Grandchildren, Hannah, her husband, Andrew, Brianna, Taylor, making sure I don't miss anyone here, and her husband, Austin, uh, Trent, and five great-grandchildren, several nieces and nephews, and many other things could be written about Charlie, but we're going to uh, instead uh, hear from some friends. You know, I met Charlie and Jean only four years ago, so you talk about not knowing somebody for very long. I'm glad that, that in just a few minutes and after the next song, Rick will be sharing with us, but here's what I know about Charlie. He was always a supporter. Man, he, he, he got behind the things that he thought were the right things. Always an encouraging person. Um, he knew that God was up to stuff, and he wanted to be involved in the stuff that he saw God being involved in. And you never heard anything but kindness from him. And now, he did have a quick, uh, sharp sense of humor, you know, and he just would wait first for the right moment to say some one-liners that really were just so appropriate, and I'm really going to miss that. But... Uh, Charlie and Jean, just easy people to love and, and just to want to be in your life. And it's people like that that build communities. So as you look at a full house here today on a rainy Thursday morning, you're, you're not surprised that there would be a lot of community people here because you guys, you guys built community. I asked Jean how it met, and it turns out, I know this will shock you, that they met at a bowling alley. <laughs> they both love the sport. And I said, uh... Well, why did it take you 10 years to get married? Because they dated for 10 years. I'm married for 59, but, they, you know, another 10 dating. And I think she, I don't know if she said this or not, but I thought it might be funny to say that she had to wait until she could beat him, and then he would marry her. So, that was, <laughs> so they finally settled down and made a marriage, but then they made a family. And I'm sure that you've seen a lot of the slideshow. And isn't it amazing, Gene, how God multiplies your efforts and just look at what you guys have been able to accomplish I will always appreciate Charlie and Jean, and especially his wit, but also his genuine enthusiasm for all of the things that were good, and he got behind all of the good things. I was reminded of uh, Galatians 2.20 that says this, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The gospel's real simple. It's, uh, it's the greatest deal of your life. All of you, and that's not a whole lot, for all of the Lord. And that's a great deal. And Charlie made that deal a long time ago in his life. And God has been good on his side, just like Charlie was good on his side. So we're going to, in, in a little bit, we're going to go to Oakwood Cemetery, to me, the most beautiful place in Waco. And we're going to uh, lay Charlie to rest at a place there, and there'll be a, a place to identify this is where... Charlie's remains are, but I want to remind you, that's, that's not where Charlie is. And I don't want you to feel sorry for Charlie, because he stepped into great reward this week. And the promises of God to him and to all of us are always true and amen. So I want to remind you of that. Jesus said these words, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes the one who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He's crossed over from death to life. So with those words, I'm going to leave you uh, with Ralph and one of the great hymns of the church of all time.
So Rick Butler is going to share with us on behalf of the family and a much longer association with Charlie Vesta than I have. So Rick, can you come and share with us? I'm afraid now. No, you don't need to be afraid. <laughs> um, Wayne, there's three parts to all the sermons, right? There's a good start to get the attention of the folks in the crowd, right? There's a good ending to wrap it all up. But in the middle, it's the meat of it, right? My dad always told our preacher, keep the middle short, will you? <laughs> Everything else will take care of it. Isn't that what you learned that's in preaching one on one? That's a good one, yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you. <clears throat> well, that's my start. That's the first part of the speech. The ending will be good. In the middle, I can't promise, will be short. It'll be a lot shorter than what it had been because for a long time, I have kept editing and editing because I couldn't tell all of the stories that I had related with Charlie Vestal in this short time. Uh, when Debbie asked me to speak the, the other day, the first thing I said was no, right? I mean, I was quick, I didn't even hesitate. But I also got yes in right after that. And I told her, I said, this is pressure. This is a lot of pressure because he's my friend, he's your friend. I've known him for a long time. Some of you have known him a long time, some of them short, but these are my memories. And my memories in the fam of the family and Charlie are mine and the families. And I hope the memories that you had with Charlie will come out in your mind as we go through this today. Is that agreed? Okay. Huds, if I go down, <laughs> you're gonna be here, right? Okay. All right. Uh, there's two people in Waco, Texas that influenced me most in my life. The first one's E.E. E. Dutch Schrader, who was my baseball coach at Baylor University. He was my coach, he was my, I was his assistant coach, and he taught me so much, not about base, not so much about baseball, but about life, organization, people, how to treat people, how to be expected, how to be treated. The other one was Charlie Vesta, and I had a long relationship with Charlie, and without him ever expressing that he was trying to teach, he just led by example, by the way he was. And I will be eternally grateful for that. So these are my reflections, and hopefully they will honor Charlie and the family today. In August 1970, I was hired by McLean Community College to become a baseball coach and a physical education teacher. It was in August. We started classes in August. We started baseball in August. I had hardly any time to recruit. I had less time to prepare for classes. Well, then I found out two of my classes were going to be bowling classes to be taught at Lake Air Lanes and there'd be 60 students in each class. Whoa. How can you possibly teach 60 people in a class, especially an activity class? So I was encouraged to go meet Charlie, Gene Dotson, at the lanes. So I did, and I walked in, and uh, I can't repeat everything he said to me that first day. <laughs> I, I guess he thought he knew me already and I didn't know him at all. He told me how they'd handled classes like that a couple of years before. They'd already started the bowling program. And uh, he said, we can get it done. In the hour and a half that we have with these kids, we'll get 60 people on the lanes with a pair of shoes. We'll be able to bowl two games, get the shoes back up, and get them back off to campus for their next class. Wow. That's organization. So we got off to it. We started doing it. 
And uh, <clears throat> I pretty much followed along the first semester. Now I taught a couple of bowling classes at Baylor as, an, as a grad assistant, but uh, we only had about 12 to 16 students in a six lane house, in the student union on the bottom floor of Baylor. And uh, I followed along and I learned very quickly. Uh, one of the biggest things I learned was that Charlie wasn't going to let anybody throw anything else but a hook ball. So uh, I walk in the second day of class, and if you, many of you have been at Lake Air Lanes, and you know the over the top of the machines marquee that he put up announcements and all that. And I looked at the marquee and I said, what? Charlie had put up a sign that said, Rick, call Flossie at BR549. <laughs> I think I was a little embarrassed that day. <clears throat> so early on, Charlie and Gene and I worked with the students, basically teaching the basics of bowling, four-step approach, arm swing, release, targeting, spare bowling, scorekeeping. And after we got done with that, uh, we got the students to bowl two games a day, and we did that the rest of the semester. So uh, we accomplished that, uh, that goal every, every semester with every student. From time to time, we'd get a little help from some of the other bowlers in Waco. Uh, Clark Norman, David Light. David, after he retired, came and volunteered for years. Um, and. Uh, we had several others that came from time to time and helped us out, so uh, the students were never lacking in, in getting help. Early in the semester that year, uh, the owner of McGregor Centers, uh, a fellow named Harold Razy, came to Waco to visit, and uh, Charlie asked me to go down and prepare the students to show Mr. Razy exactly what they'd learned in bowling class. Well, I went down and I got them all prepared. Charlie got on the mic and said, this is Mr. Harold Raises, please welcome him and we want you to show him what you've learned. 24 lanes of students got up there and threw a, their first balls in the gutter. <laughs> One guy missed the gutter. <laughs> In the summers, we had smaller classes, and they started much earlier. Classes started at 7 a.m. Charlie looked at me and he said, Pods, I can't be there that early. Here's the key. <laughs> Open up, take care of it, and I'll be there as soon as I can. Now, here's a 23, 24-year-old guy, basically very new to Charlie, but he had some trust already built up in me, I guess, to give me the keys to the entire house. I'm there by myself until he gets there. So I'm passing out shoes, I'm getting all the students ready, we turn on the lanes. If a lane busted or broke down, there goes Rick Butler to the back. I'm also the mechanic. And if I couldn't fix it, he said, move them. I'd come back up, move them, and then when John Francis got there, he'd take care of the lane. So, uh, man, that was, that was quite a trusting person to give me the keys. And I kept that for a long time. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what the security code was, but I had the keys and the security code so the alarm wouldn't go off. Yeah, I'm going to tell it. It was his birthday, 1932. I hope that's not any security that you all have set up. <laughs> Before I knew it, Charlie had me bowling in, in a league. I started in the Maple Ten Pin League, and I bowled there two years, and then the third year, Charlie asked me to bowl with him. Quite an honor. Uh, here's a young kid, young coaching, young teaching, and newly acquired friendship with him. And in, during that semester, I, well, I gotta back up a little bit. It was about that time I met Jean, early in the semester, and Debbie had just, been born, she was a toddler, and Becky, you were pregnant with Becky, and she was still bowling. So that was my first introduction to Gene Vestal, and I'll never forget that. 
two years after that, I started bowling in the men's all-stars and men's majors. And some of our teammates were Buddy Neiman, Hollis Biddle, Dexter Nolan, Bobby Lively, James Miller, Stan Patrick, Ralph Meadark, Bob Frisco, Clark Norman, H.B. Skelton, Steve Dickerson, Jack Henson, and my pods, Ralph Sparks. There's a lot of special relationships that started and grew over the years, so you can see how family and friends were developed through the bowling teams and the leagues, and from there on for life. These were wonderful friends, family, and they were nur they, they nurtured all these relationships. Okay, I've got to start telling a couple of stories. Uh, Ralph, you're gonna to have to back me up here. We, we bowled with Charlie, Mondays and Wednesdays, well, mostly Wednesdays, and he'd get a string going. He'd get the first six, seven, or eight, and uh, then all of a sudden, the ninth or tenth ball, I mean, it went somewhere else. I mean, it wasn't even close to the pocket. And after about four or five times of that, Ralph and I just start betting, okay, what, what frame is he gonna throw off? Couldn't figure it out for the longest time, but come to find out, Charlie didn't believe that he ought to have a 300 game during the league. So he didn't, he wouldn't let the bowlers think he set up the lanes for himself that night. Now, that's quite a manager. That's pretty selfless. Isn't that right? Sure. Yeah. We could just sit back there and predict it. So. We bowled in several city tournaments. We won the team event three or four times. Uh, Ralph and I began as double partners, and, and Charlie had several doubles partners uh, over the years. Um, we were state champs one year, Division II, uh, 2005 in Plano. And uh, when we left the house that day, uh, we were in second place in 2005. Computers are coming into it and all the standings are posted and we started looking on online and all of a sudden we're in first place. Hmm. The team in front of us had been re-rated and they got moved up and now we're number one. So for the next six or seven weeks we sweated it out and finally we're state champs. And that was a very special time for all of us. I mean. Ralph Bold, uh, he had a 600, I had a 600. James Soders, our ringer, I would say, he had about a 136 average, had a lot of handicap, so he even had a 540. David Light had 600, and Charlie had a 600. So uh, it was one of those times when we just hit it and hit it right, and we're crowned champions. Another year, we went to Abilene. Now, I've got a kind of let you know that when we went on state tournaments, it wasn't just a bowl. We went to have fun. So we'd leave town on Friday. We'd go to a golf course and play 18 holes of golf. On Saturday, we'd go to the, the uh, lanes and we bowled nine, nine games. We bowled that team. We bowled singles and doubles. And on Sunday, we'd retrace our steps. We'd find another golf course in play before we headed home. Abilene, Texas. This was the year in Brownwood when we were playing golf, it was 85 degrees. The day we bowled, it was 85 degrees. We get up Sunday morning and it is 40 degrees. The wind's out of the north about 20. And there's two out of the six of us that have jackets. Now, Ralph had got us on Dice Air Force Base golf course, a friend of his. And I don't think there was one of us that was going to say, no, we're not going to play. Uh, there's no, nobody going to say uncle. So we went out to play. And we're playing the holes and, and nobody's enjoying it much. And we're miserable, but I mean, we're having fun. We're, we're a group. Charlie goes to the porta potty. Okay, not unusual, but when he comes out, he slams the door and says, same to you, fella. <laughs> I don't know who he met in there, but he, he found that imaginary friend. 
When we went to Nationals several times, uh, two I remember quite profoundly is Corpus Christi and Tulsa. And uh, we had fun at Nationals. But then for some reason, we went to the National Team Tournament in Las Vegas a couple of years in a row. And uh, our bowling time was 8 a.m. Now, if many of you know, most of us, when we went to Vegas, we played some games until early in the morning, uh, like 4 a.m. And then we go get some breakfast and go to the lanes, and we'd try to bowl. First game's about over, and Ralph comes up to me, Charlie comes up to me, and says, how do you feel? Not worth a flip. Uh, how do you think we rectify that? Okay. Uh, how about a Bloody Mary? <laughs> Eight o'clock in the morning? Ooh, okay, so we get Bloody Marys, and what do we bowl? Two hundreds the rest of the games? Yeah, we all had two hundreds, so Charlie had a cure for that. Okay, uh, then there's other Vegas trips, and there's two of them that I'm going to share with you. In 1981, I was fortunate enough to be chosen as assistant coach, baseball coach, on the U.S. collegiate team that went to Japan and Korea for a friendship series. We were, I was gone five weeks. When I got home, uh, I scheduled a trip to Las Vegas with my family, Gene, the girls, and Robert Bill. Okay. Uh, got home, my daughter is four, Alicia. Uh, my wife said she, she's had enough of Alicia for a while. She said, you take Alicia and go with the vessels and have fun. <laughs> so here we go, we go to Vegas. Charlie Jean, myself, the two, Debbie and Becky and, and Robert in my van. And of course, you know Charlie didn't like to fly, so we're driving, of course, <laughs> which he always did in Vegas. And uh, we had a blast getting there. There was a few bumps. Robert, I think he got sick somewhere along the line. And, Alicia had a couple of problems. Anyway, we get out there, we stay at Circus Circus. We stay at Circus Circus because they have games, they have a circus, and the kids can be entertained, and we, we can uh, gamble and have fun. And then Hollis uh, flew out with uh, Anjanette. And I don't remember whether you were out there at that time or not, but uh, I know the kids were there. And uh, he would always take the kids and to matinee shows during the afternoon. So we got a good chance to gamble and, and Hollis did his thing with the kids. And then uh, one of the things that really surprised me, that Charlie had found out that one of the hotels had a high lie game. Now, I don't know whether you've ever seen high lie, but it's uh, a long wide court, kind of narrow, and these young men have these things called cestas, and they're great big old long nets, or, or I guess gloves, that the ball comes off, it's kind of like handball, and then they fling it back up to the front, and, and you can bet on those things. Well, Debbie, Becky, and took my daughter, Alicia, and we, they go down to the front, and they're watching the, the, the matches, and all of a sudden, after a few matches, they come running up to Charlie Jean and I, and they say, Alicia's picking the winners. I said, what? A four-year-old? How can she pick winners? And they told us, she's picking them by the colors of their jerseys. <laughs> so we make a couple of bets, and we win a little money on, on Alicia and, and had fun doing that. Uh, the next time, we went to Las, I went to Las Vegas uh, with Jean, Charlie, and the kids was with my future wife, Sharon. And that was 1989. That was just before we got married in 1990. So there's another trip out there. And of course, my future wife kept, every time we'd go by one of the marriage chapels, she'd grab my head and look. <laughs> Thank goodness Sharon's not here this morning to hear that. She, she'd kill me. Then there were the trips to Bossier. Uh, after we finished it, going uh, to Vegas, trips to Bossier were a lot closer get there real quick and have as much fun. And I think the last time that we went uh, with the Vestals was Charlie's 80th birthday. And uh, a lot of people showed up and we had a lot of fun that, that time. 
Okay, fast forward. I'm, I'm coming toward the end, so be patient with me. Recently, after Charlie had had a stroke, uh, I bit, went to visit uh, two or three times while he was at Scott and White in rehab. And, you know, one of the days I, I went there, he was actually in the rehab that day. And I snuck in back, and Gene and Debbie both motioned me in. So I just stood there. Charlie didn't know I was there. And he was, he was uh, with a therapist, and the therapist would hold up a playing card, and she'd say, okay, you pick up yours, and I want you to tell me whether your card is higher or lower than mine. And Charlie was having a little problem with that. And uh, so all of a sudden, somebody dropped something. It was like a, a tray of something that hit the floor. We all jumped. Charlie jumped, and he looked over, and he said, Reek! He always called me Reek, so he recognized me right away, and it made me feel much better about Charlie. And knowing me, I had to pop off and told the therapist, I said, ma'am, if you'll play that game with Charlie and you give him a few chips and some money, <laughs> he'll get those cards right, right away. I'm almost closed here. So Charlie promoted and taught the sport, developed many lasting friendships, and was inducted for his ability and commitment into both the local and state Hall of Fames. I've got to tell you, when he was, during his induction speech in Houston to the state Hall of Fame, he's, he's going along in his speech, and all of a sudden, you hear this ringing of a cell phone. Charlie with a cell phone? That was the Nazi Moran anyway. Well, he pulls it out and he says, excuse me, I've got to talk to my neighbor here a minute. And he flips it open and he looks. He said, well, hello, Mr. President. Yes, sir, George, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, will do. Hangs up the phone. That was the Prez, he's my buddy. George W. Bush. I don't know how he came up with that, but he did. It was, it was really funny at the time. Okay. You know, this was and is a tremendous bowling family. Not only his immediate family, but our family. I've mentioned several here today. And, uh, and that's the whole theme of everything with Charlie. It was family, bowlers, friends relatives, etc. Talking to Debbie and Becky and Jean the other day, they just started, they had jotted down a few things about Charlie that he always promoted and he always did this with the girls when they were learning how to bowl and he did it with our students and the things that he taught there are basically the fundamentals of bowling, but they're also the fundamentals of life. First, find your target. Yeah, you gotta find that direction, you gotta deliver that ball over. The second arrow, how many times have you heard second arrow, second arrow, second arrow? Find your target, shake hands, the basic, basic release of the bowling ball. Shake hands, just like you're shaking hands with somebody. Yeah, develop that relationship with the ball and people. Shake hands. Adjust to the conditions. If the second arrow doesn't work or your position on the approach doesn't work, move. Isn't that true in life too? Adjust. Plot a new course. Watch your speed. Debbie said, Charlie always with her was saying, slow down, you're going too fast. Some of us are too slow, we need to go faster. And then the basic of all of it, have fun. And boy, didn't Charlie have fun. Those five points just in there, so poignant. And I'm glad you shared those with me. Just yesterday, just yesterday, the girls passed on to me a little poem that they had found. Somebody had made a, a little plaque uh, in 1981 for his Hall of Fame induction. 
and uh, there was a poem with it, and I wish I could credit this to someone, but we don't know who wrote it. Bowling is a laugh, a grim, a grin and a glare, a strike, a split and a glare. But when you turn and the when you turn and the approach you descend, your eyes behold a smile from a friend. It isn't just for fun and play, it's the wonderful people you meet along the way. So roll the ball for the pins, a strike, a spare, a split, and thank God for the friends you'll never forget. Charlie's now in that place where he can bowl all the time. And by God, Charlie, Go ahead and throw that 300. You deserve it. You deserve it. And watch those Rangers and watch your game shows. You're in a great place now, Charlie Vestal. Thank you. The final song that uh, Ralph's going to play for us is a song that the family sang many, many Sundays uh, on their way out of church. Shalom, my friend. After that, I'll give a benediction and a dismissal, and the funeral directors will lead us out if you're going to go with us to Oakwood Cemetery. But... He wrote these familiar words. He said, The time has come for my departure. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race and I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearing. I always bold that last part because that's written to us. To all who want the kind of reward that Charlie has, we can long for the things that Charlie longed for and join him one day until we meet again. Let me leave you with this benediction from the New Testament. It's from the little book of Jude. I, I like it a lot. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. I'm going to invite the funeral directors to come to the front to lead us out. We're going to go to Oakwood Cemetery. If you'd like to join us in that procession, thank you for being here today for this family. Mm -hmm.